First up, a uh, headline here, Oklahoma budget still needs to be passed as legislative deadline nears. So Dylan Richards, who was on what seemed like full-time COVID duty, is now, I guess, back up at the Capitol uh, chasing down the last three weeks of session. Um, and so, yeah, well, let's, 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 let's just watch his little... Uh, little spiel here. I mean, Lawmakers have to negotiate between all sides to figure out the massive 2022 state budget. So even though things have slowed down publicly here at the Capitol, you can bet there is a lot of very busy negotiations happening behind the scenes. Those the change their Signy die is really the formal way of saying pencils down. The state constitution requires lawmakers to wrap things up by 5 p.m. on the 28th. By then, the House, the Senate, and the governor have to come to an agreement on the budget. Members of the 58th legislature. Course, all the way back in February, Governor Kevin Stitt proposed an $8.3 billion state budget with a $300 million deposit to savings. They called it a conservative plan as the state digs itself out of the virus slump. It's all expected to be smoother sailing than last year when session was upended by the virus. The governor vetoed the budget and the legislature overrode. Tonight, could one sticking point be, as it often is, education funding? The House saying they've got a must-have, a $135 million boost to education funding. Senate leadership saying they're receptive to getting more money into the classroom. A top Republican House member saying over the weekend on Twitter, quote, I don't want to give the many advocates fighting for this the idea that it's a done deal. We still need advocacy to help it get across the finish line. So we are still awaiting the announcement of a budget agreement that should come sometime soon. Another sticking point could be how the legislature will fund Medicaid expansion. Of course, voters demanded that they do that last year in a statewide vote. They have to come up with that money. If they don't get that done by the end of this session, so the next three weeks, they have a little bit of overtime to get that done. There's a hard deadline of July 1st, but they would have to come back here to the Capitol in a special session to do that. Of course, there. <laughs> it, it just seems like there's always more work to be done. At the Capitol, Dylan Richards, KOCO 5 News. I don't watch a lot of local news, but, you know, it was all right, I guess. Uh, so anyway, a um, little uh, dramatic I've, there. But go ahead. I know. His dramatic, he was like, he was like, oh, but what's going on behind the curtain? And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm getting a little saucy there. Um, but no, I have so many questions and comments. First of all, you know, he he brought up Stitt's plan, right, in February that he announced. And it's like, we're going to spend X amount on our budget today, and then we're going to put $300 million in savings? What are we saving for if not a global pandemic? Like, I don't understand. Like, I know rainy day funds. And, like, in Oklahoma, it's probably a good idea to have a rainy day fund because tornado season. But it's like, if we're not going to invest during a time of like a national pandemic, we're having horrible situations within like our political like instabilities, um, when we're experiencing shortages in so many goods, like, like, I just, I don't understand what there is left to prep for. Like, is he just prepping for a woman to be president? And so he's like saving that money for his big coup? Like, I don't yeah. really know. I don't know where that money's going. Um, but then also, you know, Richard brings up that education is the big sticking point, And it's always a big sticking point in the budget. And I'm just questioning who's being like, yeah, fuck those kids. That they're just not like, I understand Medicaid. I understand that expansion causing issues. I understand a lot of things causing issues in the budget. Right. You know, I come from the humanities. We care a lot about budgets because we don't really get them. Um, and so, you know, I understand those sticking points, but I don't understand who's like, yeah, kindergartners don't need to have a close relationship with their teacher. Even, you know, like they're talking about how even in the budget they are setting, like it would limit 20 pre-K students and kindergartners per teacher. Mm -hmm. 20? That's a lot of children. And yeah. as it is. And so it's like, I don't know who's like, yeah, that person doesn't need more support or yeah, students don't need more counselors. I think more than ever. I mean, my school counselors weren't great 
for anything more than being like, this is what classes you're taking. But like, we should have counselors in schools. We should be like fortifying our education system. And I don't understand why education is a budget sticking point. And it has been historically too. I just don't, I don't understand it. Well, it's because they're, they're trapped in like a, a, a box of their own creation. Like they have spent 40 years saying government doesn't work. We should defund the government. We should reduce spending. But of course, you know, as populations grow, as, you know, taxpayers want more services, as things get more expensive, you know, you have to increase spending. But there are literal groups like the Oklahoma Council for Public Affairs, which will tell you, well, when is when is it going to stop? When is education spending going to ever stop? Like, it's never enough. And it's like, well, I mean, it goes up every year because population goes up every year and we have more kids and, you know, the prices of things go up almost every year. So, I mean, like, there's lots of reasons it increases. But also, should education look different today than it did 40 years ago? And I think most of us would argue... <laughs> Probably <laughs> like, yeah. um, so yeah. Well, so, I mean, they're, they're just like trapped in their own little like echo chamber, like that they've created. Cause it's like, well, I can't say I believe we should spend more money because that's what the Democrats do, mm-hmm. but, but also we should spend more money. <laughs> yeah. Well, luckily people my age aren't having babies. So yeah. in a few years we won't be having an influx of populations in schools, but, but I just don't, like, I that. just, I just think like the whole system of like, I get it. Republicans don't like poor people. I get it. Like all of these different functions that exist within the Republican ideology of why we shouldn't fund things. But I don't, maybe it's because I've been in education my whole life and I've been in public education and I went to a state college. I don't view that as like government spending. Like no part of me like diagnoses that as oh, well, this is the government spending my tax dollars. Oh, this is this, you know? And it's like John Green had that great quote before he had kids where he was like, the reason I don't mind paying an education tax is because I don't want to live in a world with stupid people. (laughs) And that's 100% true. And not only do I not want to live in a world with stupid people, I also don't want to live in a world where a kindergarten teacher is going to like go manic because (laughs) she has over 20 students in her class, right? Like this it just is a rippling cultural effect when we like don't fund our schools enough. Um, Yeah. And that goes back to your point about the rainy day fund. I mean, it's like we, you know, Oklahoma policy Institute, which I didn't pull up any other stuff, but probably could have, uh, has done lots of things to show that our per capita spending on state services in Oklahoma has dropped dramatically over the years because of tax cuts, because of austerity, because of lots of bad policies that they've put in place. And now, because of the tax they passed right before the teacher walkout, oil prices have skyrocketed. We got a bunch of CARES Act money and coronavirus stimulus. We have a lot more money floating around, and they could invest in services. They could bring us up to like a level that we look more comparable to states around us or other civilized societies that care about their people. Um, but instead, we're going to shove it into a savings account that we may or may not even need and I just like don't get something. what else you would use a savings account for. <laughs> I think there's a good argument to say that gov- governments really shouldn't have those. Like you might have like sovereign wealth funds where you're like gathering up a bunch of money and then paying it back out, um, you know, to the citizens for some reason. Like that's a thing that's maybe not mm-hmm. terrible. But like the idea of the government just sitting on our money to spend at some point in the future is really weird. I mean, it's yeah. like not how... I mean, I I, I get it. Like, you know, you have to shell out a bunch of money when natural disasters happen, when things like that. But it's like, even when this is like a global pandemic is happening and the state is still like, nah, we don't need to give you like so much healthcare support. We don't need to give you all this stuff. Like there's still nothing being done, you know, that we're not, the state isn't like giving, excuse me, they're not like giving essential workers frontline workers all of these like cuts on their taxes or you know they're not stimulating them in any way so i just think it's all preposterous um in terms of funding and where we're going with this budget and it's also hard because it's like when the schools don't get the budget requirements that they need then they end up having to like pick and choose so much about like what they're going to do with that, with the money they do get. And, you know, I know 
during my time as, you know, a little, a little lass um, going to schools and things like that in my primary education, like all three of the school buildings that I went to went under extreme construction because the buildings were falling apart. Like they don't get this funding. They, they barely get the funding to like have an adequate number of teachers to student ratios. That's like, of course, these buildings are going to like fall in disrepair. And so then it's like, you have to pass these big bonds to be like, oh, we're going to completely redo Irving Middle School. We're going to completely redo all of these things. And then, you know, as a student, I was like, excuse me, why do I have to pay for my textbook? But you're like adding nice fancy tile to my my cafeteria. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that just comes down to local versus state. Like there's a real big separation like between, even though the electorates will vote for people at the state level that want to defund schools and train wreck everything, at the local level, they'll wildly pass like the craziest bonds. Like they'll be like, hey, we need a brand new, you know, multi-million dollar stadium. And they'll be like, all right, like cool. ra- raise my taxes. Like sounds good. Yeah. And then at the state level, it's like, hey, we want to, you know, fund curriculum or special education teachers or class sizes of 20. And it's like, uh, yeah, how about we don't do that? So anyway, yeah, it's, it's a weird. But again, I think it's because of the Republican narrative of government's bad. Don't do this. So it's like when locally, when they can go ask their school board or go ask, you know, people at the local coffee shop, like, hey, should we do this thing? And people are like, yeah, we like we want a new stadium. It'll be cool or we want a new middle school or whatever it is, right. they, they'll pass it. But at the well, state level, it gets all messed up. I think it comes down to this like rationalization that happens a lot with, I mean, everybody does it, but especially political figures being like, oh, well, this is my kid, you know, and rationalizing yeah. it to be like, oh, you know, there's always that, that she's someone's daughter, he's someone's son. Like there's always that rationalization. So I think it's very easy for local governments to like push these measures because they're like, don't you want little Timmy to have this? Don't you want little Joey? And then it like gets into the statewide system and it's like, okay, now they're just kids. Now they're just bodies. They're no longer like tangible people that are in your community. Um, And so I think that relationship divide kind of aids in that ability for like the state to have a really like tight grip on education funding and, you know, local communities to have a bigger breath.